Good evening. God be praised. We thank God for another Tuesday evening. And I'm going to jump right in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your loving kindnesses and the great multitude of your tender mercies. We bless you for being great to us and good to us. We thank you for this day of brand new mercy. We thank you for this day of faith, this day of grace, this day of joy. Thank you, Father, for all these things you have given to us freely. And we glorify your name. Teach us tonight, I pray, as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, well, we are here. I am still at work. And um, I've got miles to go before I sleep. That looks a little bit better. It's kind of low. I hope that you've had a great week since I saw you last or since Sunday. And I pray that God is being faithful. I know that God is being faithful to you. The question is, are you praising him for his faithfulness to you? Yes, it has been some difficult days, perhaps, but God has still been faithful. The Bible says he cannot deny himself. All right. Well, we're in Romans chapter eight. And tonight we're going to talk about future glory. Last week, we talked about being heirs with Christ and joint heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> So I want to talk a little bit tonight about the future glory that we have in Jesus. All right. So starting at verse 18 in chapter eight of Romans, it reads as thus. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared, compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain until now. And not only they, but also ourselves, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. All right, I want, let's see. Is that as far as I want to go? I think I may be reading over what I designated. Okay. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. This is verse 26. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for us according to the will of God. And we know that all things, verse 28 work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. All right, let's jump right in. I hope that I can get to all of this tonight. Uh, it's, it's just... Uh, I get chills when I read chapter eight of Romans because it is such a, it's an uplift. It is, uh, I don't know, reinforcement. It is that encouragement that we need in sometimes our darkest hours. So let's look, starting at verse 18. Paul says this, or the writer says this, for I reckon, I love that. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, uh, let me read a couple of translations for you. I am of the opinion that there's no comparison between the pain of this present time and the glory which we shall see in the future. Also, for I calculate, I calculate that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared or to compare to the coming glory that shall be revealed in us. But I love that word reckon. Reckon means to bring an accounting to. Um, it's the bottom line. It's a, it's the total or the sum total of all that has occurred or whatever we are uh, contemplating for our reckon. That means the books are balanced. 
Hmm? So that the things that have happened to us, they're not equal to the glory that God is going to give to us. They, there's no, they don't weigh out. Okay. For I reckon the sufferings of this present time. And that's whatever we're dealing with right now. Uh, I think I was praying the other day and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, forgive me for not trusting you. I, I don't know what I prayed about. And I don't know if it was past, present um, or how far in the past it was. And I said, Lord, forgive me because I didn't trust you when I prayed. And I, I could feel it so clearly when I started to pray that there was doubt. I'm praying this, but I don't know if God's going to do it. I'm praying this, but I don't think I'm worthy. I'm praying this, but I think God hates me. And sometimes we do that. Uh, somebody asked me, well, teach me how to fast and pray for a particular thing. And, and that says to me, of course, that we're already scared about the outcome and we are worried about the fact that there may be something in us that's going to cause God not to listen to us. Well, none of that is true. None of that is true. And when you pray, you must believe that God can do it, that God will do it. Otherwise, don't ask him. And I know this, that given the human condition, we see so many things happening. We say, God, we pray. Why didn't this happen? And why didn't that happen? When you said we, if we asked, we would receive. And sometimes it just doesn't work that way. Not because God's word is not true. Not because there's something wrong with us or God is angry with us. But it is because it's we're following a plan. And we don't always understand the, the totality of that plan. I've said this time and time before, when my mother passed away, that wasn't in my plan, but it was God's plan. And also, just as I was praying for the Lord to raise her up, perhaps she was praying, God, take me home. So who is he going to listen to, me or her? And um, sometimes God has to, we have to defer to, there's a will that we just don't understand. And so we pray for peace and contentment when God's will prevails over what our desire is. So let's look at Romans 8. Now, the sufferings of this present time, you have to understand that at this time, Christianity was quote unquote new. So there was persecution for those who named the name of Christ. The church at the time, the synagogue, the Jewish uh, what we equivalent to a church, they were very jealous and they only wanted you to serve God. And it's not unlike some cultist religions today. You can only serve us. You can only do it through us. Otherwise, you're going to hell. Otherwise, we got to kill you in the name of G in the name of God. They don't say Jesus. We got to kill you in the name of the most high and all this kind of stuff. And that's the way the church at Jerusalem was. I'm oh, sorry. The synagogue at Jerusalem was the Jewish church, if you will. The, well, the Jewish uh, gatherings, the Jewish synagogues. I don't know what, what to call them exactly. They weren't a church. But because Christianity was new and preaching Christ was almost a death sentence. Believing Christ was a death sentence. So they suffered some persecution. We think we suffer persecution now. Oh, why? Well, I wanted to wear red. They wanted to wear white. So they chose white. And, you know, um, I heard somebody say one time about a lady coming to a funeral in red. Now, you know, you don't come to a funeral in red. Hmm. So we we persecute people because we have our own beliefs and we have a very stringent system when it comes to holiness. I had an interesting conversation the other night. And here's, here's the bottom line. Let me defer to that for just a moment. When dealing with our kids, the question we must ask is, what do our kids see? And this is evidenced in uh, sometimes I have students to do things and it's amazing how they seem oblivious to what's going on in the education world. And um, when I put them on display in front of the class, they act just like me. They fuss just like me and, you know, they make remarks just like me. And I'm like, wow, you are listening. So they may appear to not be engaged in what's going on, but they're listening. And they can imitate what they've seen. Now, if that's the case, when we talk to our kids about how they treat, um, when we look at, let's look at young men and we talk about the way they treat women, the question is, what did they observe growing up? We talk about relationships for young ladies. What did they observe growing up? And if they're, if they're doing something that you are uh, in disagreement with, ask yourself, what did they see coming up because those are the things they're going to imitate. Those are the things 
that ha have been embedded in them. And um, so we talk about persecutions and we don't have any persecutions, not like they did, not like they did. And um, the, the writer said that these sufferings, people were being killed because they said, I'm a Christian. People were being killed because they were seen coming from a meeting place of Christians out of a church, of, well, a meeting place at that time. People were killed because some of their family members were Christians. Or I don't know, perhaps they had property taken. Perhaps they were, they were certainly, uh, you know, made to be embarrassed. They were ridiculed in public. And so the writer says, all this stuff that we're going through, ultimately death, we're going through. But guess what? What we're going through is not a precursor to what the reward is going to be. No, in fact, it is a pale comparison to what the Lord is going to give us. It's just not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. You're thinking, um, so, and I heard somebody say this, and I, and I hope that I've helped them to understand that this ain't the way it is. I hope my good outweighs the bad. No, you, you can't even imagine. Remember the scripture that says, eyes have not seen, the ears heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. You can't even begin to imagine the glory, the wonder, the splendor that, what is glory? Uh, the dignity that's going to be returned to us because we, we have endured some suffering. We have endured some persecution. We have. None of us have been killed. Of course, we're still here. Uh, we don't know if anybody has been killed because they were Christians, but we've all suffered some indignities for Christ. We've, we've suffered some loss for Christ. We've gone through some things for Christ, emotionally, physically. We've gone through some things. And that glory that God is going to return to us doesn't even compare to what we're dealing with now. And, and you can put it like this. Let's, let's bring it. I'll bring it home. Uh, it's like akin to winning the lottery. So if you pay, what is it? $2 for the, the Powerball or whatever it is. I think, I don't know. I asked somebody the other day and they said something about 4 or $5. So I don't even know. But to give, let's say $5 for a lottery ticket. And then you say, well, what's the return? What's the rate of return? Well, for most of us, it would be zero because the odds of winning the lottery are like 200 and some thousand or 300 some thousand to one. So if I had $300,000, well, I wouldn't have to pay the lottery, I hope. But um, to get back to pay $5 and your return is 50 million or 100 million, and even when um, when it gets up to the now, you know, at least once once a year, once every two years, it gets up into the billions or at least a billion dollars. So to say, play a dollar, play five dollars and your return is going to be a billion dollars. You can't even imagine that. You look at other people and say, oh, they got a billion dollars. They got a yacht. They got a, this house and they got a house here and a house there and a car. There, and there. You can imagine that but you don't understand the actual experience. You can't even begin to say that this $5 is actually worth a billion dollars. You can't even begin to fathom that. Not unless you win. And if you win, call me. My number is five, 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 five. All right. So he's saying that you're putting in a very small amount. And it may seem like a lot to you, but trust me, it's a small amount compared to what the Lord is actually going to return to you. I don't know why this scripture is sticking in my head. Second Corinthians, I think, nine and eight. Um, that says God is able to make you abound. That's nine and eight. But uh, scripture says um, that uh, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Will God cause men to give into your bosom? And we use that, of course, when we want you to, to give offerings. And um, I'm trying to find the scripture. Uh, we want people to give offerings. So to give something, 
to give it to God means that God will cause that thing to be returned to you, but it's going to multiply immensely. Given it shall be given good measure. So um, it's like if you, you uh, I've watched, you know, people bake in the kitchen or whatever. And so they want um, flour. So, you know, you need a cup of flour or people who just know how to cook. They don't even measure. They just go get that, that flour and it's running over and you got flour in the cup, but then there's a mound on top. Yeah, that's good measure. But then he says, I'm going to press it down. Why is he pressing it down? Because he's going to add something to it. Hmm? And then I'm going to shake it and make sure you get all the air pockets out, shake it together so that it's solid. But then it's shaking together, but then it's going to run over. He says, shall men give into your bosom? Same thing here. You're giving up your life. You're giving up your time. You are being persecuted. And what you're giving up now is going to be returned to you. Good measure. Pressed down shaking together and running over, but that's going to be glory. It's going to be more than you can imagine. All right, let me move on. All right. And he says it shall be revealed in us. It's going to be, um, it's going to be realized, it's going to be manifested in you, not just intangibly in you, but both tangibly and intangibly. Um, it will be revealed to us. Our eyes will be opened. The revelation will be what the suffering was for, how it mattered, and how we're going to receive that. Uh, I, I want to say reciprocity, but I don't even think it's reciprocity. This is going to be a reward that God is going to give to us. And why do I say that's encouraging? Because when you're dealing with things and it looks like they're never going to end, just like, Lord, when are you going to deliver me? When are you going to take me out? You can comfort yourself and say, hey, the glory that's coming is much bigger and much better than what I'm suffering. So God give me grace to suffer this because what's coming next. Oh, wow. All right. Verse 20, or verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, this is so important. The earnest expectation of the creature, what creature? All of God's creation. The earnest expectation of all of God's creation is for you to get in the right place, the manifestation of the sons of God. When the sons of God have been revealed to this world, when the sons of God have uh, moved into the right place and, and, and on the receiving end, when God is giving back to, when God is, is, is using us to the fullest extent to get the glory, through persecution, he uses us, through praise he uses us, through worship he uses us. But when God gets the glory, when the sons of God step up to the plate, then it says uh, or that the creature, this world is waiting for the manifestation. This is so interesting because when we had the lockdown last year or the year before, they were talking about how the, the earth itself was changing. Not only the earth was changing, but animals were changing their behavior. So one thing that was very remarkable, and we were locked down for what, four months, I think, strictly locked down for four months. In um, Italy, in the canals of, of Venice, where they don't use streets as much as we do, but they, they uh, travel using boats. And all of that water was dark. It was black. And when people stopped, they were inside, they couldn't pollute it anymore, and Whatever they were adding to it, I don't know. But it cleared up. It got clear and they could see all the way to the bottom. And they saw all of the trash and things that people had dumped into the, the river, whatever it is. And they were like, wow. And um, air pollution started to clear up in some places and just different things happened because the sons of God, the world, now move to a different place. Now, you know, I mean, it's an analogy. It's not a perfect analogy. But there was something different about the way men handled the earth. And the earth began to clean itself and to free itself. And how tragic it is we had to go back to the same practices. And there are still some people who don't believe in global warming. They don't believe that. 
there's climate change and I'm not here to preach to you that you ought to believe it, that you ought to understand it, but one must recognize that the more we do things, the more we see a change in our world. I was telling someone today, I think uh, I was looking at a milkshake and I was like, man, I remember growing up, chocolate used to be so chocolatey. It's not chocolatey anymore. And um, those of you who grew up with me or around me before, I mean, yeah, a little bit before me, shortly after me, you understand a lot of things taste differently now. And rightly so, because they will tell you they've changed the ingredients. Anybody remember KFC? Y'all remember KFC? Kentucky Fried Chicken, that's what it was. It's KFC now. But remember Kentucky Fried Chicken? They had the best chicken. I mean, that original recipe, was that was something. That was something. And the coleslaw was just right. It was the perfect sweetness and the perfect um, bitter mixed together. And it was just, it was perfect. It was just creamy. It was perfect. But now you go there and get the coleslaw. Well. And the chicken, I'm not going to talk about that. I eat it under duress, but it's certainly not what the colonel did. It was not what the colonel made. And the colonel said to them, I'm going to sell you this this formula, but you cannot change it. We we won't change it. We promise. And as soon as he signed on the dotted line, they already started making changes. And they did that to make more money from that formula because it costs so much, you know, to make it perfectly. So they stretched it out, thinned it out, probably added more water or milk flour. Or, I don't know. But it's not what it used to be. But it was it was a miracle that when we stopped polluting the earth, the earth started to clean up. And here, when God delivers us, then he's going to deliver the creature as well. The entire earth is going to just, you know, and even the scripture says there was a new heaven and a new earth, you know, not just refurbished, not uh not reusing, but he's going to remake the entire world, okay? For the creature, that is the earth itself, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, and vanity uh, meaning uh, it's moral depravity. That's what the dictionary says here. Creature was, was made subject to our ways. The world was made subject to our ways, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Now watch this. When man was put out of the garden of Eden, he said, you got to go now into a place where you got to work the ground. They're going to be thorns and thistles and things all of that nature. Why? Because you allowed corruption to come into the earth. And so thorns and thistles were not a part of God's plan, but because there was sin in the world, thorns and thistles arose. And, uh, all the other whatever negative things happen in the garden, the bugs and the weevils and the whatever you call them, they eat the, the plants and kill the plants, the locusts and all that stuff. That's a byproduct of sin coming to the world. So he says, not willingly, um, but by him who subjected the same, meaning God, put the world in this condition or allowed this world to come in this condition because of the hope that was going, that was for man, that the son would come and bruise the head of the serpent because salvation is for everybody. There's one salvation that saves everybody and everything. So he was not going to save two or three of us and then come and save two or three of us and then come save two or three of us. No, salvation is a full covering from head to toe. And there was only one salvation that was tailor-made for everybody. Verse 21, because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. I mean, when God does it for us, it's going to be done for the creature. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Um, I know some of you may not know this, but um, photosynthesis is the process by which trees or green things make... um, food for us to eat so um, the plants take light from the sun and water and carbon dioxide and create fruit or create beans and greens and you know all those things so they are producing food for us okay but you have things where 
Sometimes there's a fungus that grows on the plant. Sometimes the, the apples are too small because they ain't enough water, whatever. Whatever mishaps happen in nature happen because of sin. And the Bible says they're groaning together with us. They're waiting for us. They may not have that intelligence that we think of, but they know that our deliverance is going to be their deliverance. Verse 23, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit. We can call on Jesus and we get the salvation and we have the, the impartation of, of eternity in us. We have the first fruits of the spirit. All right. Even we ourselves grown, uh, grown. So we, I'm sorry. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Uh, I just read where Tyrese Gibson's mother passed away in the last day or two and how broken he is. And I, I feel his pain. Another friend of mine lost his mother recently, uh, last week. I feel his pain. I feel his pain. My godmother, Mildred S. Brewer, one of my godmothers, <laughs> um, she passed away 101, almost 102. And her son, her granddaughter, I feel their pain because I have been there. And we are groaning because of all these things that are happening. We don't want to lose people to COVID, the car accidents, the cancer, whatever. We're all struggling with that pain. And we're struggling with economic inequities and, and racial disparities. We are struggling with all of those things. And we're waiting for this physical body to be adopted and to be brought into the glory of God. I want to be like him. I, I don't want to suffer these things. I have some, some back problems now, perhaps my own fault, but I don't want back problems. Difficult getting up. Difficult walking. People say, what's wrong with you? You look old. Uh, here's a secret. Mm. But we, we don't want these things. So we ourselves are groaning within ourselves. God, when will it get better? But then he says this, verse 24, for we are saved by hope. But that hope, I'm sorry, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what is he hope for? If I got it, what was the old proverb? A bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. I'm going to get those two birds and we're going to have a big feast. But I got one in my hand. So I really don't have to worry about if I'm going to actually eat or not because I got it in my hand. If I got it, then I'm not expecting for it. I'm not hoping for it. <clears throat> but if we hope for that, which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Okay. Uh, the literal, transversion, literal translation says, but if we hope for what we do not see through patience, we wait eagerly. I like that. Through patience or through endurance, we wait eagerly. We wait with a, a full expectation. We wait with a full joy. We wait with a praise. We wait, wait with, you know, a hallelujah. We wait with expectation that God will do it. And we've got to we've got to allow ourselves to move to that place where we are rejoicing in God, knowing that what we've asked for, we're going to get it. Knowing that what we need, he's going to provide. I don't have it yet, but I'm hoping eagerly. I'm preparing for it now. I'm, I'm you know, oh, I smell the pork chops cooking. So with an eagerness, I'm waiting. I don't want them now. I want them when they're done. I, I don't want them pink inside. I don't want them half done. I want them done. So eagerly I'm waiting for So I'm prancing around, turning around in circles. I don't know. My hands are already washed. My The fork and knife are already in my hand. Eagerly I'm waiting because I know it's coming. I already smell it. I, I, I Well, me seeing it, I can't see it. I'm in another room. I smell it. I know it's going to happen. All right. A weak analogy, but you understand what I'm saying. All right, so there's an eagerness because in our spirits, we have already received it, but we're waiting for a manifestation. We're waiting for it to be realized in the same plane where we are. Hmm? Verse 26. Oh my gosh, I, I don't have time. This is the verse. The linchpin, I suppose, of at least of this discourse. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. 
for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But he that, uh, but the spirit itself make an intercession for us hmm, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now watch this. In the same way, the spirit is a help to our feeble hearts. This is part of our patiently waiting in eagerness. Or uh, The spirit already knows what the promise is. The spirit has already uh, provided the promise. The spirit is walking out the promise. The spirit is, is issuing out the promise. It's the conduit to get to the promise. But here we are waiting. And, and we're from pillar to post. We, we're of this mind and that mind. And we're thinking this and saying that. And we're just all over the place. We're hoping for something that we cannot see. That is that redemption or that, that being adopted into the, the, uh, the official, or should I say, the official plane of 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 airiness with Jesus Christ? We're waiting for that. So while we're bopping around like a pinball machine, the spirit says, "Calm down," and the spirit begins to help us in our weaknesses. All right, um, and our weaknesses is our faith is up and down sometimes. That our confession is up and down sometimes. Our emotions are all over the place. And so while we should be standing fast with God and believing the word, sometimes we flip-flop. We're all over the place. Not only that, but I mean, uh, the things that even, and I walk with God is fragile. I'm saved today and I feel saved. I can go out and save the world today. Tomorrow I don't even care if the world gets saved. Our frailties. I, 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 I love God, but I had a moment and I relapsed. You know, I cussed somebody out, or I did whatever. I, I back and forth. Our weaknesses, that thorn in the flesh, that tendency to be human and to sin. Oh wow, yeah. But the Spirit helps our infirmities. The Spirit doesn't throw us away. People do, but if we make mistakes, if we fall into sin, the Spirit does not throw us away. It prays for us. And helps us in our weaknesses, our infirmities. Oh my gosh, I love it. For we don't even know how to pray like we should. I pray for my mother to be healed. I pray for my mother to come home. Not that it wasn't a it wasn't a bad prayer. It was a great prayer. It was the prayer of the century. Father, raise her up according to your word. But he says sometimes our praying misses the mark because at this moment I don't know what I should be praying for. Hmm. So what the spirit does, it, it intercedes for us to cover us for we don't know what to pray for when we should pray for it all the time. Even that, the spirit is praying for us and interceding for us. The spirit will alert somebody else to pray for us. The spirit will alert somebody else to go into a moment of praying I remember one time I, I the, the the Lord shook me and said, get him and pray now. It was two o'clock in the morning. So, okay. And he called some names out and I got up and started praying, calling out those names. Like, Whatever it is, God, do it. Two o'clock in the morning. Then I found out later, here's a short version. They were, they were arrested. I don't know if they were arrested, um, but they were being detained by the FBI and I. Hmm. There's no local jail. And um, they had been chained to a wall. Now, they probably were sitting, but they were chained to a wall. And guess at what time they came and said, you can go. 2 a.m. <laughs> I was like, what? Hold up, wait. They said, about 2 o'clock, they came in and said, y'all can go. Didn't charge them. They let them go. Hmm. The spirit itself helpeth our weaknesses. And the spirit, the Bible says it groans or puts our desires into words, or puts our desires into words, which we are not in our power to even say. I, 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 this thing is so deeply rooted in me. I want to pray about it, but I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to how to intercede on this behalf. That's why we pray in tongues. And that's a whole nother talk show topic, because what happens is. 
that the, the spirit prays for us bypasses our minds, our hearts, and our emotions and goes straight to the throne to intercede for us. Don't get worried. I don't pray in tongues. Don't get worried right now. The spirit still prays for you and intercedes for you. And the intercession is in such a such a plane, such a level that don't worry about trying to understand it. Because what the spirit prays is the will of God. Not the good of that situation in your eyes. Oh, it'd be great if I win the lottery. No, the spirit prays the will of God. It'd be great if they raise him up. I'm praying the will of God. In verse 28, I'm just about out of time. Wow. Verse 28. Why am I so happy that the spirit prays for me according to the will of God for my life? I should have been a CEO. I should have been president. Wasn't the will of God. It's a good thing. But no, no. The spirit prayed for me. The will of God. For we know all things are working together. Hmm? For good. To them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. Hmm? I'm just trying to read these other translations while I'm quoting that. We're conscious. Think about it all the time. That these things are working together for good to those who have love for God. Um, we know the ones loving God, all, all things work together for good. We have known, this is from our past experience, that to those loving God, all things do work together for good. Here's the prerequisite. Love God. That is it. If you love him, the things will work out. For your good. All things. Those things that we deem as tragedies. Those deems that we think, deem as. Uh, oh this is the worst mistake I ever made in my life. Those things that we say. I'll never recover from this. Oh my reputation was destroyed. My, my husband, my wife, my spouse. Whatever walked off and left me. My kids hate me. All things work together. For good. But you got to relax and let the spirit do the praying. Well the spirit's going to pray. Stop fighting against the spirit. Lord, show me your will. Help me relax in your will. Here's a good way to let the spirit pray the will of God for you and you not fighting against it. Walk in, Lord, I love you so much. I thank you for your goodness. I praise you for your faithfulness. I thank you that you are, that you are uh, the shadow, that I'm under the shadow of your wing. Thank you, Father. That with long life, you're going to satisfy me. I thank you that you're going to show me your salvation. I thank you that you have picked me up out of the muck and the mire. Clay. I thank you because you have forgiven all my iniquities and healed all my diseases. I thank you. I am yours. I'm, I'm the sheep of your pastures. You made me, not me, not myself. I'm thankful. I mean, just pray the word. I know what I want. I know what I desire. But let me just praise and worship God while the spirit does the praying. The more you work, the more he rests. The more you rest, the more he works. All right. And verse 29, and I'm going to stop right there and I'll pick it up again next week. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. I got a few more minutes. Good. Here's the thing. Be comforted about this. For whom he did foreknow. Hmm? He knew of you before you came into existence. If he knew of you then, he certainly knows you now. He knows what you need, how you need it, when you need it, where you need it. That's why the father knows what you have need of before you ask. Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son. Now stop trying to figure out who the predestinated ones are. If you call on the name of Jesus, you predestinated. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is say, I want to be a part. And boom, you're part of the predestination. You can't figure God out. Stop trying to do it. You, you, you cannot come up with an algorithm to understand how God chooses us. You cannot come up with a, a, a means and a way, a rhyme nor a reason to explain God. Just be thankful that you're hearing this word. That means that you're predestinated. 
Be thankful you, you got this experience because that means that God has a plan for your life. And he's not, you're not just floundering. You're not going to fail. You're not going to fall out. The bottom's not going to fall out. You, you're not going to be devastated and, just, and destroyed and whatever else negative thing you want to say or the enemy has said to you. No, because your God is a faithful God and he's much greater than anything you're going to face. He's praying for you right now. And he's praying the will of God for you right now. How do I know you're going to make it? You were predestined to make it. You are the head, not the tail. The first and not the last. Above only and not beneath. You have life and life more abundantly. Well, that's about all the time I have tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget us. Go to YouTube. Um, Greater Dimensions Dunnellan. Like our videos and subscribe. I need your subscriptions. Greater things ahead. God is doing great things and will continue to do great things. I will see you on Sunday. Don't forget to pray for the sick and shut in. Sister James tonight needs your prayers. Um, Shay needs your prayers. And all of Greater Dimensions, we need your prayers. And your loved ones, pray for them. Pray for us. And we'll pray for you. God bless you.